Today, the SEC and Coinbase had their showdown before the judge, and there's some major takeaways, incredible statements from the judge, and I want to share what are the three outcomes that we can expect. And Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse and Lehman Beard from HBAR, or Hedera, I should say, talked about working together. This is a big partnership that could be coming down the line. And BlackRock now has over 16,000 Bitcoin in their ETF as Jamie Dimon spreads FUD about Bitcoin once again. We're going to break this down and much more. Let's get into it. Welcome to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. If you are new here, please hit that subscribe button as well as the thumbs up button and leave a comment below. If you're listening on a podcast platform such as Spotify or Apple, please leave a five star rating and review. It supports the podcast and it doesn't cost you anything. Well, folks, big day today and a lot of folks were paying attention to this. There was actually a call in number to listen to the Coinbase versus SEC lawsuit. Uh, they both testified before the judge today. Here's what Paul Grewal, chief legal officer at Coinbase, tweeted out at the conclusion of today's hearing. Today, we made arguments in our motion to bounce the SEC suit against Coinbase. After hours and hours, this much remained clear. The SEC continues to claim broad authority over all investments while offering no limiting principle to its definition of investment contract. The SEC cannot unilaterally expand and redefine its own regulatory ambit. This should be left up to Congress and the ongoing legislative discussions about regulatory frameworks that are currently taking place. Coinbase does not offer securities. We are confident in our legal arguments and look forward to a decision that will bring much needed clarity to the industry. We appreciate the opportunity to present our case, and we thank the court for its careful consideration. Now, folks, remember, scumbag regulator Gary Genser and the SEC sued Coinbase, and this coming years after approving their S1 to go public, understanding Coinbase's business model and all the products and services they offered. In the SEC's case against Coinbase, they listed about 13 tokens, which includes Solana, Cardano, Polygon, Filecoin, Sandbox, and many others. So once again, the SEC is not litigating each of these tokens individually. They're trying to throw them into this lawsuit and pseudo call them securities without giving them due process. So once again, scumbag regulator Gary Genser at work here. And this lawsuit is bullshit. You know, we've talked about it. Uh, Gary Genser is just going around shaking down companies. He and the SEC will ask you to come in. Then they will stab you in the back and throw you under the bus. And we see they are breaking the law. They're hypocrites. They will lie and cheat. Just look at the debt box situation where they lied and the judge threatened a sanction against them. Uh, judge Sarah Nepper in the Ripple lawsuit said the SEC lacked faithful allegiance to the law. However, this judge is well-versed about crypto, and she's seen all of these things played out. Her name is Catherine Polk Phila, if I'm saying that right. And uh, boy, did she make some incredible statements today, and I'll share some of the details. Here, Metal Law Man gave an update. Uh, he says, the long-awaited hearing is over. As expected, there is no ruling from the judge. So the judge has not made a ruling, and we could see a ruling, look, by next month or three months from now. Uh, but her statements, which I'll share with you guys, were incredible. Uh, he says, there is no knockout blows delivered by either side, and frankly, not a lot of high points over the course of the five-hour hearing. The judge was the star of the show. She was exceptionally well-prepared. She drafted 14 pages of questions for the hearing. She understood the terminology and technology. She is the kind of judge you want to handle a case of this magnitude. There was some interesting banter about the relative merits of Judge Rakoff's ruling in the Terraform Labs case and Judge Torres's decision in Ripple. Both judges work in the same building with Judge Phila, uh, but the judge gave nothing away in terms of how she viewed the reasoning of each of those cases. So that's an important factor, guys, that she works in the same building. She's seen these cases, she's seen the rulings, and she understands the tech. That's positive for the crypto industry and for Coinbase. There was a general consensus that tokens are not in and themselves securities, but the SEC argued nonetheless that transactions of tokens on secondary trading platforms like Coinbase can still constitute sales of investment contracts. Folks, we got to thank Ripple 
for this respective consensus that the token in themselves are not securities. And obviously the Judge Torres ruling with XRP uh, is setting a precedence here. So that's really great. The SEC lawyers were better prepared than when they were caught flat-footed in July and were generally effective making their case. The lead lawyer for Coinbase, William Savitt of Watchel Lipton, I'm saying that right, uh, was methodical in his approach to answering the judge's questions. Each side was given a few minutes of summation time to say whatever they wanted at the end. And in that space, Savitt definitely stepped up his game and finished with some strong closing points. I watched the judge carefully. She is either genuinely undecided about how to rule or she's a great actor. The one message I took away was she was uncomfortable with the idea of dismissing the case based on the major questions doctrine. My guess, and it is just a guess, is she is going to allow the case to move forward uh, like the Ripple case. But I continue to believe, as noted in my pin tweet, that Coinbase will ultimately win the case in the end. Congress, of course, could put a stop to this whole thing with the adoption of comprehensive crypto regulation, but that won't happen this year. I expect the judge will issue her written decision on the motion within the next three months. So pretty incredible stuff, guys. And let me share some more details here. Jake Traversky weighed in and he had some great thoughts. He says, today's Coinbase hearing revealed a key flaw in the SEC's legal theory. It turns nearly every asset on the planet into a security. So the SEC was arguing beanie babies, everything. It's it's ridiculous. Uh, Jake says, that can't be true. The SEC was created to regulate markets for financial instruments, not digital goods or technologies empowering them. Judge Fila seems to get this flaw quite well. Here's a quote. I am presented with the specter of collectibles being regulated by the SEC, she said. Uh, Jake said she's right. The SEC's theory would give it authority over sneakers, trading cards, watches, basically anything with a market price. And of course, folks, we know this is ridiculous, right? The SEC is out of control. We've talked a lot about it. They are rotten at their core. They have fallen far from their core mission. The SEC has clearly gone way off mission in its attempt to regulate crypto. That's a policy failure as much as a legal one, made worse by the SEC calling crypto a rounding error today. If so, the SEC's disproportionate focus on attacking this industry is unjustifiable. Judge Fila noted other problems with the SEC's case too. Here's an example. It's poor understanding of the tech, calling out the DeFi education funds amicus brief for explaining it better. It's attempt to usurp the role of Congress, calling out Senator Lummis amicus brief saying this is our job. This doesn't mean Coinbase will necessarily win its motion for judgment on pleadings, but it does display the true emptiness of policymakers claims uh, that the law is clear and the industry just doesn't want to comply. It's a fight, but we have the high ground. So I agree with Jake here. There's no guarantee that Coinbase is going to win. I do believe, though, folks, that Coinbase is going to come out with the lion's share of the victory here. Um, maybe the judge you know, extends some sort of discovery and whatever it is, and by that time, Gary Genzer is out of office. Uh, Congress has passed crypto regulations. We'll see. But I think this exposes the SEC and all of their hypocrisy, lies, and failures, and much more. And it goes back to what I've been talking about for a long time, optics and narrative, right? Gary is losing this, and that is so important in politics. And the SEC has become political. You look, Gary Genser is appointed by Biden, and Biden's not doing well right now. So we are headed to the next presidential election. And uh, these statements from the judges carry a lot of weight. And, uh, you know, it's the, the executive, legislative and judicial branch, right? So the judicial branch is not putting up with the bullshit or the lies or the hypocrisy. These judges are calling out the SEC. And I think that's important. Now, Eleanor Tourette of Fox Business was covering this today. And I want to highlight some of the things that she tweeted out about what the judge was saying. They're uh, very, very big statements. Here, she said, Judge Fila uh, said, are there some guardrails in the commission's arguments because I am concerned, the Amici says I should be, that what you're asking for is too broad a definition of what constitutes a security. What does my finding in your favor mean for the purchasers of these 12 or 13 tokens? Here's what the SEC lawyer replied. It would mean these purchasers have bought a security in the form of an investment contract. 
uh, Phila, Judge Phila said, if these purchases are found to have bought a security, would purchasers have the right of rescission? The SEC lawyer says, yes, they would. I think this was a gotcha question here by the judge because rescission, but the purchasers have right to rescission. I'm, I honestly have never heard of that. So I think the SEC lawyer screwed up here. Um, here is another great, great quote from uh, the judge, which I think is very bullish. Judge Fila just asked the SEC why she shouldn't listen to Senator Lummis, who says Fila should dismiss the case. Uh, here's a quote. She's not just a random senator. She's someone deeply involved in this space. Why is she wrong? The SEC lawyer says a senator's opinion shouldn't be able to overrule 90 years of securities laws. Filer then addresses the Howey test, addressing it in the way Lummis portrayed it. Listen to this, folks. We've had a good run. We've had 90 years where these securities laws have been able to apply to these markets. But now we have something new. Wow. Judge is saying we need the Howey test updated for crypto. Folks, remember what the Ripple team and lawyers have been saying? We need a new Howey test and we'll name it the Ripple test, right? Because you cannot apply the Howey test as it currently stands to blockchain networks with tokens distributed globally and these networks are decentralized. It's insane to try to do that. When the Howey test was written, they were not they had no concept of blockchain networks on the internet distributed globally, right? How can a bunch of tokens in the United States be securities and other countries are virtual currency? It's just insane. It's nonsense, right? And there's no investment contract and there's secondary markets. This thing is complex. It's very layered. So you have to have new updated rules for, you know, in the year 2024. It cannot be a 1930s law. It's, it's incredible what's happening here. But the SEC... Like I said, they, they don't care. They, they're they just corrupt at this point. Now, folks, quick word from our sponsor, and that is Uphold, which is a great platform I've been using since 2018. You can buy Bitcoin and all the top altcoins. You can also trade precious metals on this platform. They have 260 plus cryptocurrencies. They have a great app. Uh, folks, they are available in 150 countries. They support many fiat currencies. And best of all, they have full reserves. You can go review their transparency reports. They don't commingle or lend out your funds, so you can go review their audits and uh, all the things they're doing there. So if you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Now, folks, uh, Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse it was at Davos, and so is Lehman Beard of Hedera. And they had an interview together. Um, it was done by Max Walker Williams. Um, I'm actually, I've actually not heard about him before. But uh, folks, there were some interesting takeaways where, you know, they talked about working together. So uh, Garlinghouse representing Ripple stressed the importance of such partnerships, stating we're going to make sure that we start talking about whether we can collaborate as well. So uh, there's some clips, of, you know, floating around where they're looking at, you know, how can we work together uh, and partner together? So I hold both tokens, HBAR and XRP, bullish on both. And uh, I've often talked about diversification is important, but these two powerhouses working together will be incredible. Remember, Hedera has Google, IBM, Boeing, and so forth, part of their enterprise. Um, and Ripple is working with some big partners as well, such as American Express and so forth. So we'll see how they can work together, but that would be a huge partnership, folks, and uh, uh, pretty incredible. I I I'm actually super excited to see what they come up with, but uh, bullish news here. Now, Jamie Dimon. At Davos as well, of course, continues his fud about Bitcoin and crypto, even cursed on TV, He's saying, don't talk to me about that shit. <laughs> He's like, this is the absolute last time I'm going to talk about this. But guys, I don't even need to play the clip. He just continues to spread fud. But I did tweet out, folks, this is actually maybe bullish because I've watched Jamie, Jamie Dimon since 2017 spread fud, talk negatively about Bitcoin and crypto, and the asset class continues to grow and get adoption. Now it's getting an ETF and he, he continues to talk negatively. So maybe it's like a inverse Jamie Dimon, right? Uh, well, you know, it's positive for the market. The more bearish, the more against it he is, the more it continues to grow. So you know what, Jamie, keep talking negatively. I don't care because I, we know JP Morgan is participating in the ETFs. Here, Edward Snowden tweeted about this. He said, 
While how the SEC approving a Bitcoin spot ETF was all it took to transform the CEO of JP Morgan from the king of money into the guy who spends one half of every interview insisting, I don't care about Bitcoin, and the other half sobbing that it stole his wife and shot his dog. <laughs> so if he's being a bit tongue in cheek there, but the point he's highlighting is Jamie uh, supposedly hates Bitcoin, but he talks a lot about it. And, and you know, that could be, you know, like the Shakespeare uh, quote, he doth protest too much. It really bothers him. And he's trying to hide and cover up something, right? Uh, so Jamie Dimon up to his old tricks. Now, Anthony Scaramucci, who I've had on the podcast quite often, he was he's also a Davos. And, you know, he highlighted something about what's going on with Elizabeth Warren, who controls Gary Gensler and the whole agenda against crypto. He said when Elizabeth Warren dropped out of the presidential race in 2020, she's obviously a Democrat, she made a deal with Joe Biden to exert control over the banking industry. And we know Elizabeth Warren connected to those banking collapses in early 2023 and those uh, shorting of, the, of those banks and, and much more. So uh, Elizabeth Warren is a crook slimy. I didn't realize this until I got into crypto and I started getting, we started seeing more information how she operates and that she's positioned herself as anti big bank and so forth, but she's not. That's just a facade. Just look at her and Jamie Dimon having a conversation just a couple of weeks ago, right? Uh, they're all together in bed together. And, you know, folks have shown her net worth and it's incredibly large amount of money and they're like how did you make this amount of money off a of senator's um salary and of course i think we know the answer to that right backroom deals checks you scratch my back i scratch your back and all that stuff now folks franklin templeton which has 1.5 trillion dollars of assets under management <laughs> today they went full bananas with crypto man they were i'm sure some of you guys saw this they were tweeting about bitcoin it's like the the meme, you know, the intern took over the Twitter account. <laughs> they were talking about blockchains. They were talking about layer ones, Ethereum, Solana. They say they have massive potential. It's incredible that these Trad5 folks are promoting crypto. I mean, they were really talking a lot about Solana as well. So I think we see the direction things are headed in, right? I do have some soul tokens. I, I'm not a long-term big bag holder. I, I'm going to swing trade it and make some money off of it, but incredible they were posting memes about bitcoin <laughs> they were talking about bitcoin ordinals and layer two solutions just incredible stuff um now blackrock now holds over sixteen thousand uh bitcoin in fact it, the number is sixteen thousand three hundred and sixty one bitcoin worth over 707 million dollars so this number continues to grow since they tried started trading last week incredible what's happening folks very bullish um, here, Vanek, which is one of the Bitcoin spot ETF issuers, they are removing Bitcoin features uh, from their platform because they now have a spot ETF. That's great news. Futures, we know, you know, mostly used to short the market, but they got spot ETF. So why have futures? Great sign. I hope other players decide to do this as well. Very bullish times are ahead, my friends. Don't forget, volatility will be here. This market is very volatile, but you can use it to your advantage to swing trade and to dollar cost average in and have a macro outlook. That's how I've been navigating this market and how I've learned to make money with it. Have a macro outlook. Look at all the factors, not just, okay, what does the technical analysis show, but what's the DXY doing? What's global liquidity look like? What is the Fed doing, right? All of these different things impact the markets. And uh, I believe we are entering the next macro bull market. It's, I think, a two-year process, 2024, 2025. I think we see the Fed cut rates this year. The money printer get turned on possibly later this year as the elections come around. Biden's going to want the economy and the stock market looking good, right? Every president has done it. So all politics and all these things aside is just what happens. Um, and then I think uh, global liquidity as well will rise. Other countries will turn on the money printer and uh, assets will rise. And that includes crypto, folks. So bullish times are ahead. You got to be patient, expect volatility, and uh, be patient. Now, folks, please support the podcast. Please, please, please. I am asking for a huge favor here. It doesn't cost you anything. Subscribe to my free email newsletter. Link will be in the description. Also, follow me on TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and all the social platforms, Twitter X as well. Uh, once again, it doesn't take a dollar out of your pocket. It's free. Just follow, just like. I really appreciate it. Thank you for watching and listening, and I'll talk to you all 
later. 